Welcome to the talks on We Will Remember Them from the Tom House in Lancaster. <clears throat> Introducing D-Day. Have you ever seen The Longest Day or Saving Private Ryan? Perhaps you have read historical accounts or heard family stories of June 6, 1944. The D-Day landings in Normandy remain embedded in British popular memory, celebrated as a pivotal moment when World War II swung towards an Allied victory. Historians have long argued about Allied grand strategy and operational performance in Normandy, but at the heart of the Allies' vast military machine were ordinary people. It should be remembered too that D-Day was a truly international effort. The Normandy landings were the first stage of Operation Overlord, the Allied plan to invade Northwest Europe. The map shows very little blue areas, that's the areas under Allied control, which is surrounded by areas under Axis control, the red ones. On June 6, 1944, Allied assault troops landed in five coastal sectors codenamed Utah, Omaha, Gold, Juno and Sword. Key objectives included establishing a solid presence ashore and capturing Cannes, a hub of German transport, communications and defence. Festung Europa or Fortress Europe. After 1940, the Allies mostly concentrated their forces in North Africa and the Mediterranean. Hitler was aware, however, that a cross-channel invasion was likely to come at some point. The Fortress Europe plan aimed to reinforce German defences across the continent. In early 1942, construction began on the Atlantic Wall, an interlocking series of coastal fortifications intended to stretch from Norway to Spain. The number of mines laid along the coast increased from 1.7 million to over 4 million by May 1944. Beach obstacles in the form of metal girders welded into X-shaped hurdles with mines attached were also embedded in the shoreline. Colloquially known as hedgehogs, their job was to block enemy tanks from moving up the beaches. Inland, vertical wire brace poles attached to mines were erected to prevent gliders and airborne troops from landing. These were known as Rommel's asparagus. By June 1944, the Normandy coast was thus protected by a solid line of defences. However, although Rommel acknowledged the possibility of invasion in Normandy, German forces remained concentrated elsewhere. D-Day thus came as something of a shock to soldiers like Fritz Jels, who was stationed at St. Marl in Brittany. When the invasion started in Normandy, we were woken up at about four o'clock in the morning to hear that Britain and American allies had landed in Normandy. I didn't know, even know where Normandy was. Poor intelligence and the Allies' successful disinformation campaign kept the Germans guessing about the anticipated cross-channel invasion's location. I will, not, I will now talk about the build-up to June 6, 1944. Only one Victoria Cross was awarded on D-Day. There were countless acts of bravery on D-Day, but one man exceeded them all. Company Sergeant Major Stanley Hollis of the 6th Battalion, the Green Howards, advanced inland from Gold Beach and single-handedly captured 30 German soldiers entrenched in two pillboxes. Later, during an attack on an enemy, enemy field gun position, he allowed two of his men trapped under fire to escape by charging the Germans while shooting a Bren gun from the hip. Uninjured, aside from a graze to his ch cheek from 
a sniper's bullet, Hollis earned a Victoria Cross for, for his heroics. It's the highest award for gallantry in the British honour system and the only one awarded on D-Day. The medal takes pride of place at the Green Howards Museum in Richmond, North Yorkshire, along with those awarded to Stanley for his service during other campaigns, including North Africa and Sicily. On display too is an unusual version of his medals, miniatures, which Stanley wore on special occasions, as he didn't like the weight of the full-size medals. His wife bought him a set of miniatures that he wore on evening dress, the family also have the telegram from Buckingham Palace informing Stan's wife that King George VI was awarding her very gallant husband the Victoria Cross. Courage of the Mad Piper of Normandy. Bill Millen appeared to be the most vulnerable Allied soldier on the Normandy beaches on June 6, 1944. While those around him came ashore fully armed, Scotsman Bill Millen carried nothing more lethal than a set of bagpipes. Bill's son John said his commanding officer, Lord Lovett, told him to play a tune or two to boost morale as the soldiers advanced up Sword Beach. I shan't tell you what Dad thought about that particular order, but he did it. Two of those around Bill were killed almost immediately. One by shell fire, one by a bullet. But somehow Bill survived. And a practical explanation might be the Germans took the view that it was bad luck to shoot a mad, unarmed man on the field of battle. Bill died in 2010, age 88, having earned himself the title of the Mad Piper. And he left a cigarette case, a book of poems by Robbie Burns, a practice <coughs> chanter, which is a small woodwind instrument that bagpipers practice on, and other bagpipes that saw action in Europe after Bill's first set was destroyed. Operation Overlord. The planning for Operation Overlord was meticulous. Nothing was left to chance. The instructions issued by military, naval and air staffs ran to many hundreds of pages in true British style. Nervousness was camouflaged with jokes. With so much at stake, American and British planners alike suffered from pre-day jitters, but one of General Omar Bradley's <coughs> staff officers, the wonderfully named Colonel Charles Bonesteel III, observed later, the British had a much greater fear of failure. This was true, with memories of the hurried <coughs> evacuations from Norway, Dunkirk, Greece and Crete, as well as the disastrous raid on Dieppe in 1942. As the Germans recognised, the British were very brave in defence, but often far too cautious in attack. There are numerous reasons for this, including the tendency for British military myths to focus on heroic defence, the squares at Waterloo, the sieges of Lucknow, and Rourke's Drift. It must also be remembered that by 1944, after nearly five years of hostilities, there was considerable war weariness. Britain and Canada also had started to suffer from a severe shortage of manpower, unlike the Americans, and this was one of the reasons for Montgomery's caution. The British Army had other more systematic flaws, Soldiers and NCOs had become far more politi politicised than their father's generation in the First World War. As a result, a trade union mentality influenced attitudes to what could be expected of them. American and Canadian observers were amazed by the British soldiers' expectation of regular tea and smoke breaks. A fag and a brew up. On DD itself, an American officer reported, there was also a feeling amongst many of the men that having landed, they had achieved their objective and there was time for a cigarette and a brew up. A Canadian Glengarry Highlander remarked with cheerful exaggeration, the British Army couldn't fight for three and a half minutes without tea. 
A week later, when part of the 7th Armoured Division attacked Villas Bocage, troops stopped for a break in the town before sending out reconnaissance patrols or taking up fire positions, with disastrous results when the Panzer Ace Michael Whitman charged into town with a Panzer tank. Many German soldiers were deeply influenced by propaganda, particularly in the Waffen SS. They believed that Germany would still destroy the Western Allies and then defeat the Red Army. Such arrogance that would lead to defeat. An initial study in the British Army was carried out in Italy by Major Lionel Wigram. He estimated that in most platoons only a handful of men really did the fighting. Another small group of men were likely to run away at the first opportunity. Those in the main group in between would follow the fighters if things went well, or the potential deserters if they went badly. General Montgomery was so horrified by the report that he had it suppressed. The Germans divided their soldiers' combat performance into four categories, which were essentially the same as Wigram's breakdown, except they split the main group into two. Group 1, those who enjoy fighting. Group 2, those prepared to fight. Group 3, those reluctant to fight. Group 4, those who will flee from their duty. Eighty years have passed. Eighty years have now passed since that grey day in June 1944, which began the liberation of Western Europe from Nazi occupation. One might have expected interest to diminish with the passage of time and the deaths of participants. Yet there are more museums in Normandy and more visitors than ever. Even with the horrors of Omaha Beach, casualties on D-Day were far less than had been expected. The real carnage came later and further inland during the battle for Normandy. We think of fighting in Normandy as a desperate struggle between the Americans and British on one side and the Germans on the other. But in fact, it was the most multinational clash of the whole war. On DD itself, the invading and bombarding forces did not just consist of British and American formations and units. Warships and other vessels came from many Allied countries, France, Poland, Norway and Belgium. Squadrons of aircraft overhead were manned by Canadians, New Zealanders, Australians, Rhodesians, Poles, French, Belgians, Dutch and Norwegians. Within the Wehrmacht, non-Germans such as Poles, Czechs, Alsatians and Luxembourgers had been forced into units defending the Atlantic War. They also included many taken prisoner from the Red Army on the Eastern Front. The decision. Southwark House is a large regency building with a stucco facade and a colonnaded front. At the beginning of June 1944, five miles to the south, Portsmouth Naval Base and the anchorages beyond were crowded with craft of every size and type. Grey warships, transport vessels and hundreds of landing craft all tethered together. D-Day was scheduled for Monday, June the 5th and loading had already begun. Southern England had been enjoying a heat wave compounded by drought. Temperatures of up to 100 degrees Fahrenheit had been recorded on May 29th. Yet the meteorological team Attached to General Dwight D. Eisenhower soon became uneasy. Dr. James Stagg, the leading civilian weather expert, had just been given the rank of group captain in the RAF. Since April, Eisenhower had tested Stagg by asking for three-day forecasts. On Thursday, June 1st, the day before the battleships were due to sail from Scapa Flow, weather stations indicated some deep depressions forming over the North Atlantic, rough seas in the English Channel could swamp the landing craft. Low cloud and bad visibility presented another great threat. Eisenhower had other reasons for pre-D-Day jitters. Although outwardly relaxed, 
He was smoking up to four packs of camel cigarettes a day. His nerves were not held by constant pots of coffee. The possibilities of leaks at all levels were innumerable. An American Air Force general had been sent home in disgrace after indicating the date of Operation Overlord at a cocktail party in Claridge's. The Commanders The fate of French civilians was just one of many worries as Supreme Commander Eisenhower had to balance political and personal rivalries while maintaining his authority within the Alliance. He was well liked by Field Marshal Sir Alan Brooke, the Chief of the Imperial General Staff, and by General Sir Bernard Montgomery, the Commander-in-Chief of the 21st Army Group, but neither rated him highly as a soldier. The Allied commanders in the photograph before D-Day were on the, uh, left to right on the front, Air Chief Marshal Sir Arthur Tedder, Eisenhower, Montgomery. Behind, we've got General Omar Bradley, Ramsey, Lee Mallory and Bedell Smith. Monty's characteristically terse judgment on Eisenhower after the war was nice chap, no soldier. These opinions were certainly unfair. Eisenhower demonstrated good judgment on all key decisions over the Normandy invasion and his diplomatic skills held a fractious coalition together. General Montgomery Despite his considerable quality as a highly professional soldier and first class trainer of troops, he suffered from a breathtaking conceit which almost certainly stemmed from some sort of inferiority complex. In February, referring to his famous beret, he had told King George VI, private secretary, my hat is worth three divisions. The men see it in the distance and say, there's Monty, and then they will fight anybody. His self-regard was almost comical, and the Americans were not alone in believing his reputation had been inflated by an adoring British press. Basil Littlehart said, Monty is perhaps much more popular with civilians than with soldiers. There were other tensions in the Allied command structure. Eisenhower's Deputy Supreme Commander, Air Chief Marshal Sir Arthur Tedder, loathed Montgomery, but he in turn was deeply disliked by Winston Churchill. General Omar Bradley, the commander of the 1st US Army, who came from poor Missouri farming stock, did not look very martial with his hayseed ex expression and his government issue spectacles. But Bradley was pragmatic, unruffled, apparently unambitious, somewhat dull, neither flamboyant nor ostentatious, and he never raised hackles. A shrewd commander, driven by the need to get the job done. He was outwardly respectful towards Montgomery, but he could not have been less like it. Bradley got on well with Eisenhower, but did not share his tolerance towards that loose camel, cannon, George Patton, a God-fearing Southern cavalryman, famous for his profanity, enjoyed addressing his troops in provocative terms. I want you to remember that no bastard ever won a war by dying for his country. You win it by making the other dumb bastard die for his country. Omaha Beach worried the Allies, although neither Eisenhower nor Bradley could admit it. The most difficult of the five landing beaches was going to be Omaha. So General Bradley sent Captain Scott Bowden to check if the beach was firm enough for tanks. The day after his return, he was summoned to London by a rear admiral. There, in the long dining room, with maps covering the walls, he faced six admirals and five generals, including General Bradley, who interrogated him carefully. Scott Bowen said, I hope you don't mind my saying the beach is a formidable proposition and there are bound to be tremendous casualties. Bradley put a hand on, on his shoulder and said, I know my boy, I know. Omaha was simply the only possible beach 
between the British sector on the left and Utah Beach on the right. A weather forecast. Group Captain Stagg hurried to the library to present his report to all the key commanders for overlord. Well Stagg, what have you got for us this time? asked Eisenhower. Stagg replied, the whole situation from the British Isles to Newfoundland has been transformed in recent days and is now potentially full of menace. Several senior officers glanced out of the window at the beautiful sunset in slight bewilderment. It was still light because they were operating on double British summertime. After questions about the weather for airborne drops, Eisenhower probed further about the likely situation on June 6th and 7th. There was a significant pause. Stagg said, If I answered that, sir, I would be guessing, not behaving as your meteorological advisor. Stagg and his American counterpart Colonel Yates withdrew. Early the next morning, Saturday the June 3rd, the news could hardly have been worse. The fears we had yesterday have been confirmed. A picture of rough seas, winds up to 4-6 and low cloud. General Eisenhower sat motionless, staring at stack. All the rooms seemed to be temporarily stunned. Eisenhower felt compelled to recommend a provisional postponement and at 04.15 on Sunday June the 4th the 24 hour postponement was confirmed. The convoys were called back. Destroyers set, set to sea at full speed to round up landing craft who couldn't be contacted by radio. If the bad weather continued then the tides, tides would be wrong and if con Conditions did not improve in 48 hours, Overlord would have to be postponed for two weeks. It took everybody. DDA preparations required immense manpower. In 1944, the Allies gained air superiority over northern France, enabling reconnaissance on coastal defences and reducing the Luftwaffe's presence. The photo shows LCTs, landing craft tanks, moored at Southampton, 1944. Civilian labour was stepped up as British factories expanded production. Approximately 40,000 workers were secretly employed making two prefabricated Mulberry harbours to enable supplies to land in Normandy. Over 1.5 million US servicemen arrived in Britain to swell the international invasion force. Popular memories of D-Day have often neglected the contributions of ethnically diverse troops, including African American and black British soldiers, to the invasion success. Thinking outside the box, for instance, over 6,000 Caribbeans joined the RAF, playing important roles in aerial bombing campaigns that diverted German air strength away from Normandy. Similarly, it is often forgotten that women were integral to the success of D-Day planning and operations, working in factories and the auxiliary armed services, or as intelligence operatives, meteorological experts and nurses. Ingenious weapons were developed, including Major General Percy Hobart's funnies, a new specialised range of tanks. Most famous was the Sherman DD, see the photograph, with a canvas flotation screen that enabled the tank to swim ashore from a landing craft. The second photo is black United States soldiers in Trafalgar Square, March 1944. Intelligence gathering was vital. Using top secret ultra intelligence code breakers at Bletchley Park who decrypted German signals and monitored troop movements. In response to a BBC appeal, the British public sent in over one million snapshots of pre war holidays in France, providing Allied planners with details of the Normandy coastline. 
Ruses, deceptions and ingenuity were pillars of D-Day preparations. Deception plans like Operation Fortitude created a dummy invasion force, misleading the Germans into believing that landings in France would be further east at Pas de Calais. Allied disinformation campaigns bombarded German intelligence with fake radio communications. Bearing the cross of Lorraine, Winston Churchill's obsessive desire to be close to the centre of action prompted him to insist that he sail with the invasion fleet. He wanted to watch the bombardment from the bridge of HMS Belfast. Fortunately, he read a letter from the King on June 2nd. My dear Winston, I want to make one more appeal to you not to go to sea on D-Day. As King, I am head of all the services, and there is nothing I would like better than to go to sea, but I have agreed to stay at home. Is it fair that you should do exactly what I should have liked to do myself? Churchill's war cabinet realised that the free French leader had to be invited. Winston wrote to Roosevelt, despite all the faults and follies of de Gaulle, he has lately shown sign of wishing to work with us, and after all, it's very difficult to cut the French out of the liberation of France. The President insisted that in the interest of security, de Gaulle must be kept in the United Kingdom until the overload landing had been made. The most important event on the evening of Sunday, June 4th, took place in the library at Southwark House. At 21.30 hours, Stag was summoned. Rain and wind were battering the windows. As he said, there would be a brief improvement on Monday afternoon. The weather would not be ideal, but his message was it would do. Eisenhower turned to Montgomery, who was wearing his unconventional uniform of a Ford pullover and baggy corduroys. Do you see any reason why we should not go on Tuesday? Montgomery replied emphatically in his nasal voice, No, I would say, go. Attention eased. Eisenhower's grid returned. There was much to be done to get the 5,000 ships from a dozen different nations back to sea and of course down pre-established shipping lanes. Another Lord Hope Men of the American 101st Airborne Division at Green and Common were due to take off at 2300 hours for the mission. Unlike the infantry and other arms who had been enclosed in the barbed wire sausages, the airborne troops had been driven directly to the airfields from where they were to take off. For five days they had been quartered in aircraft hangars and provided with rows of cots with aisles in between. There they stripped and oiled their personal weapons time and again and sharpened their bayonets. They had been instructed how to kill a man silently by slicing through the jugular and the voice box. Their airborne training had not only been physically rigorous, some of them had been forced to crawl through the entrails of blood of hogs as part of getting toughened up. Many paratroopers had also been listening to Axis Sally on Radio Berlin, who played music as well as transmitting vicious propaganda. She said on repeated occasions before D-Day that the Germans were waiting for them, most regarded it as a joke. Axis Sally was the name given by the US forces to Mildred Gillars, a jailed American uh, a failed American actress from Portland, Maine, who had moved to Germany in 1935 to become an announcer on Radio Berlin. She broadcast music as well as Nazi pr pr propaganda designed to undermine Allied morale. She was tried for treason in 1949 and served 12 years in prison. I believe personally she should have been hung. Colonel John Johnson, who led the 501st Parachute Infantry Regiment, said to his troops, 
Before I see the dawn of another day, I want to stick this knife into the heart of the meanest, dirtiest, filthiest Nazi in all of Europe. A huge resounding cheer went up and his men raised their knives in response. On the evening of the great undertaking, Chill sent a, a signal to Stalin. I have just returned from two days at Eisenhower's headquarters, watching the troops embark. With great regret, General Eisenhower was forced to postpone for one night, but the weather has undergone a favourable change, and tonight we go. Watch on the channel. While the Wehrmacht awaited the invasion, Adolf Hitler remained at the Berghof, his Alpine residence, on the mountainside above Berchtesgaden. Hitler was in confident mood. He longed for the enemy to come, certain that an Allied invasion would be smashed on the Atlantic Wall. Goebbels even implied that the Allies would not dare to cross the channel. Hitler had convinced himself that defeating the invasion would knock the British and Americans out of the war, then he could concentrate on the Eastern Front against Stalin. Gerd van Rundstedt regarded the Atlantic Wall as just a bit of cheap bluff, and he believed that the Wehrmacht should abandon Italy, that frightful boot of a country, and hold a line across the Alps. He also disagreed with the retention of so many troops in Norway. The photo shows von Rundstedt visiting Hitler's own guard, the 12th SS Panzer Division, Adolf Hitler. Left to right we see Rundstedt, Kurt Meyer, Fritz Witt and Sepp Dietrich of the 1st SS Panzer Corps. Rommel in charge of the Atlantic War. Almost all senior German officers were privately scathing about Hitler's obsession with fortresses. The ports of Dunkirk, Calais, the Loin, Le Havre and Cherbourg on the Channel Coast and Brest, La Rochelle and Cherbourg on the Atlantic. These garrisons, 120,000 men in the case of Northern France, would not be available later to help defend Germany. Hitler had been had given the task of improving the channel defences to Erwin Rommel. And the, the photograph shows Erwin Rommel, the commander in chief of Army Group B, who had become dejected by the effects of Allied air superiority in North Africa. Hans Spiedel was chief of staff to Rommel and said that his boss bitterly quoted Hitler's own dictum in Mein Kampf. When the government of a nation is leading it to its doom, rebellion is not only the right, but the duty of every man. And that was the start of the plot to kill Hitler. With bad weather on June 5th, the Germans decided that it was not worth sending out naval patrols into the channel that night. As a result, the flotillas of Allied minesweepers were able to advance in line abreast towards the Normandy coast, completely unobserved. Anne Spiegel, Rommel's aide, was about to go to bed at 0100 hours on June 6, when the first reports came in of airborne landings. The General's battle cry, so different. Brigadier General Slim Jim Gavin of the 82nd Airborne was the most measured in his address. Men, what you're going to go through in the next few days, you won't want to change for a million dollars, but you won't ever want to go through it again. For most of you, this will be the first time you will be going into combat. Remember, you're going in to kill, or you will be killed. Gavin clearly created a strong impression. One of his men said, I believe we would have gone to hell with it while another commanding officer decided to adopt shock tactics. Look to the right of you and look to the left of you. There's only going to be one of you left after the first week in Normandy. That must have gone down like a lead balloon. 
The greatest fear was to face an enemy with an empty gun. Bandoliers were slung crossway over their chests, Pancho Villa style. Canteens were filled to the brim, pouches packed with spare socks, camouflage netting helmets, had an aid kit fixed to the back with bandages, eight sulfur tablets and two syringes of morphine, half for pain and two for eternity. Pockets and pouches bulged, not just with 150 rounds of .30 ammunition, but also DD ration chocolate bars, which possessed a texture akin to semi-set concrete, and a British gammon gr grenade, which contained a pound of C2 explosive in a sort of cotton sock. This improvised bomb could certainly be effective against even armoured vehicles. Paratroopers called it their hand artillery. Others were armed with a Thompson submachine gun. Several rounds of anti-tank grenades were packed in leg bags, which would dangle during the descent. The leg bags alone often weighed 80 pounds. Sealing off the invasion area. Until Germany was finally defeated, Stalin needed all the American assistance he could get in the form of lend lease trucks, food and steel. In addition, his worst fear was that the Western Allies, Allies might be tempted to make a separate peace with Germany. Stalin had washed his hands of France. He could not forgive her collapse in 1940, which, contrary to all his calculations, had left the Soviet Union suddenly vulnerable to the Wehrmacht. A special operations executive in London which was in radio contact with 137 active stations, estimating that by the spring of 1944, <coughs> the strength of the resistance approached a total of 350,000 members. Rommel was well aware of the threat to his lines of communication, not just from the resistance, but above all from the Allied Air Forces, saying, we will undergo the same experience with supplies, in the invasion battle, as we had in North Africa. The supply lines will be destroyed and we will get nothing across the Rhine as we got nothing across the Mediterranean. Roosevelt firmly rejected Churchill's plea that French civilians should be protected at all costs by arguing that the Luftwaffe should be the main target, saying, however regrettable the attendant loss of civilian lives is, I am not prepared to impose from this distance any restrictions on military action by the responsible commanders that in their opinion might militate against the success of all of the overload or cause additional loss of life to our allied forces of invasion. French civilian casualties reached 15,000 killed and 19,000 injured in 1944 before the invasion. Finally, in the early evening of June, June 5th, the resistance heard the messages. Les descend sur la tapis. The dice are down. It was followed by Il Fechot à Suez, the signal to attack all lines of communication. The airborne assault. During the hour before midnight on June 5th, the roar of hundreds of aircraft engines in a constant stream could be heard over villages near airfields in southern and central England. The photo shows the pathfinders of the 6th Airborne Division synchronising watches immediately before takeoff. Three Airborne Divisions were taken to the air in over 1,200 aircraft. The British 6th Airborne Division was headed for the east of the River Orne to secure Montgomery's left flank. The American 101st and 82nd Airborne Divisions would be dropped on the Continental Peninsula to seize key points, especially the causeways across the flooded areas inland from Utah Beach. The first group to take off was D Company of the 2nd Battalion Oxfordshire and Buckinghamshire Light Infantry. They left even before the Pathfinder Detachment sent ahead 
of the main force to mark dropping zones. This company, commanded by Major John Howard, was flown in six horse gliders towed by Halifax bombers. Officers and soldiers had blackened faces and wore round paratroopers helmets with camouflage netting. Armed with rifles, Sten submachine guns and bread guns, the Halifaxes took them to the east of the invasion fleet and aimed for the seaside resort of Carburg, where there was a gap in the German flak defences. British Airborne Landings, June 6. Their objectives were two bridges close together, one over the River Orne and the other over the Cannes Canal. They had to seize them before the German guards could blow demolition charges. As the horses swept in, the men braced themselves for the shock of landing. The two pilots brought the cumbersome glider in with an astonishing accuracy. After bumping, leaping and skidding across the field, the nose of the glider came to a halt. The two pilots were knocked unconscious in the crash that they had achieved a landing within 50 feet of the pillbox beside the bridge. Some of the plywood horse gliders, affectionately known as hearses, that must have cheered everybody up, broke up on impact, so soldiers scrambled out through the broken sides as well as the door. The first men out of Howard's glider held grenades through the slits of the pillbox. The rest of the pl platoon led by Lieutenant Dent Brotheridge, were already charging across the bridge. But by the time the platoon reached the other side, the German guards had opened fire. Lieutenant Brotheridge was mortally wounded from a shot through the neck and died soon afterwards. Another platoon led by Lieutenant Sandy Smith, who badly broke his arm in the landing after a fierce but mercifully brief firefight, the bridge over the Cannes Canal was secured. Sword Beach. Howard immediately ordered an all-round defence and sent Lieutenant Dennis Fox's platoon out in fighting patrols to probe the nearby village of Benneville. The curious choice of success signal for the two bridges, Hammond Jam was sent off by radio. Howard could hardly dare believe that such a tricky operation had gone entirely to plan, but then at 130 hours, the platoon defending the bridges heard the unmistakable noise of armoured vehicles beyond Benneville. By then, paratroopers were landing all over the place. German officers were desperately ringing regimental headquarters. In some cases, they could not get through because of resistance and cut the lines to increase confusion. The RAF had mounted Operation Titanic with a force of 40 Hudsons, Halifaxes and Stirlings. They dropped over 250 dummy parachutes and window aluminium strips to confuse radar, as well as SAS teams uh, who were there to cause mayhem behind the lines. The dummies were little more than rough scarecrows with a device to make them explode and catch fire on landing. But these exploding puppets caused many commanders to think it was a large-scale diversion. Only Max Pencil, Chief of Staff of the 7th Army, recognised at the time that this was the major invasion. But many commanders refused to believe him, including General Joseph Reichardt, commander of the 711th Infantry Division, who had been sceptical about the whole invasion, now sends it was starting. Two captured British paratroopers were brought in, but they refused to answer questions. But the accuracy of maps found on them shook Reichardt, as they showed almost every gun and placement. Pegasus Bridge. Not all prisoners were so fortunate elsewhere in the sector. A helpful, well NCO in Reichardt's division executed eight captured British paratroopers, probably in obedience to Hitler's notorious command affair, which demanded the shooting of all special forces taking on raids. 
of the British Airborne operations that night, Major John Howard's success with the two bridges was about the only one which went according to plan. Despite losses, the men remained resilient and achieved their objective. As Howard explained, we were so thrilled to have this special job, the spearhead of the invasion, as it's often been described, that we wanted to get the job done, and that seemed to overcome all our fear. Benoville Bridge was later renamed Pegasus Bridge, honouring the wing horse emblem of the British Airborne Troops, which you can see on the right with the winged emblem of the Airborne Forces. Brigadier James Hill, commander of the 3rd Parachute Brigade, had warned his officers before their de departure. Gentlemen, in spite of your excellent training and orders, do not be daunted if chaos reigns, as it undoubtedly will. Objectives. Major General Richard Gale, commander of the 6th Airborne Division, had formulated a sound plan to secure the left flank of the landings. His force needed to occupy and defend the area between the River Orme and the River Deeds, five miles further east, by destroying five bridges on the eastern side. He could make use of the Deeds and the floodplain around it, which the Germans themselves had inundated as a barrier against armoured attacks. He could then concentrate the bulk of his forces facing southwards to hold off an expected counter-attack from the 21st Panzer Division. For this, they needed anti-tank guns, which would be brought in with the 1st Glider Force two hours later. Another important objective for the 6th Airborne Division was the battery at Merville, on the far side of the Orme estuary from Ewistrand, RAF Air Reconnaissance had monitored the preparation of these emplacements for coastal artillery. Large calibre guns there could wreak havoc on the fleet and the landing ships, as well as Sword Beach, the most easterly landing sector. Their massive concrete construction made them virtually impervious to bombing. Lieutenant Colonel Terence Otway's 9th Battalion of the Parachute Regiment, therefore, received orders to capture the site and destroy the guns, the barbed wire defences, minefields and machine gun positions around them, made this an awesome assignment. A bombing raid by Lancaster's to soften up the defences was due to go in just before the battalion jumped, then four horse gliders carrying an assault route were to land inside the wire and on top of the battery a truly awesome objective. Practice sometimes is not perfect. Otway's men have practiced the attack many times over back in England, but chaos was, decided, was destined to reign. The battalion was dropped all over the place, partly due to their aircraft taking evasive action when the flak opened up. Many paratroopers fell into the floodplain of the River Deeps. One of Otmay's men was sucked into a bog and drowned in mud, despite efforts to save it. The airborne soldiers had been equipped with duck calls to try to find each other in the dark, but the battalion was so spread out that these could not be heard. Fewer than 160 men out of 600 reached the rendezvous point. Two sticks of the 9th Battalion had failed to join Otway because they were dropped at saint Pair, 16 miles too far south. Their officer went to a nearby house to find out where they were. Horrified by the news, he told the men to break up into small groups and try to make their way back to join the battalion, but many of them would be captured on the way. Altogether, 192 of Otway's battalion were still unaccounted for at the end of the battle for Normandy. Otway could not wait any longer. He had to complete his mission before all 600 hours, when the six-inch guns of the light cruiser HMS Arethusa would open fire but much of their kit had been lost, 
They have no mind detectors, but we decided to carry on with only a quarter of his force. The next blow was to find that the Lancasters coming to soften up the battery had missed their target. A young officer and the sergeant crawled ahead through the minefield to mark the way. Then the attack went in. The force of 160 men suffered 75 casualties in a matter of minutes, but they still seized the emplacements, but they found only 75mm guns, not the 150mm heavy coast artillery. Using the plastic explosion, they blew the breaches and retired as best they could with their wounded to be out of range before HMS Arethusa was in position to open fire. A mortal sin. Three other 7th Parachute Battalions of Gale's Division were also to be dropped between the rivers Orne and Deeks after the bridges between uh, Bonneville and Ranville had been secured by Howard's company. The next objective was to destroy the bridges over the Deeks. This was the task of the 3rd Parachute Squadron, Royal Engineers. After the bridges were blown, the 8th Battalion took up position around Bois de Bobo. Some soldiers drowned in the ditches of flooded areas adjoining the River Deep. Brigadier James Hill dropped into the water only waist deep, but all the tea bags in his trousers were ruined. He soon suffered a far more serious blow when British bombs exploded nearby as he threw himself sideways, landing on another officer. Hill was wounded in the buttock. He then saw a blown off leg on the path. It was not his. It belonged to Lieutenant Peters, the man on whom he had fallen. Peters was dead. One of the Canadian officers noted that his men were all in a very suggestible state before departure. Their Catholic padre had ranted in his sermon before takeoff they should not be going to meet their deaths with the means of mortal sin in their pockets, packets of condoms, but as soon as they were in action, fighting for the village of Varaville, they showed no lack of courage. They also had confidence in their commander, Brigadier Hill, showing a rare respect among Canadians for a senior British officer. Howard's little defence force was relieved by the 7th Battalion, commanded by a Lieutenant Colonel Pine Coffin whose name alone qualified him for a place in an Evelyn Wall novel. These reinforcements were able to increase the bridge by occupying the area on the west bank of the canal, including Bonneville. Allied armour plus veterans' voices. As the grey dawn broke across the French coastline, the Germans discovered that an armada was arriving on their doorstep. The naval phase of the Allied invasion, Operation Neptune, delivered approximately a quarter of a million Allied troops across the British Channel to Normandy by the end of June 6. William Dunn, Sapper, 5th Assault Regiment, Royal Engineers said, it was one of the most marvellous sights you could ever wish to see. To see that convoy, when they all got out to sea, I've never seen a sight like it. Crossing the Channel. As the Armada set off for Normandy, morale varied considerably. Some soldiers, like those of the 1st Battalion Hampshire Regiment, experienced a, deep, a distinct sense of relief when their vessel sailed into the channel in the evening of June 5th. As their commanding officer recalled, the men had been living in cramped conditions on board their troop ships for the previous five days, and there was not, in fact, even a glass of beer to be had. Unfortunately, the weather rift remained far from ideal, with strong winds and heavy seas. Conditions were very rough for the Allied troops, especially as those who travelled in flat-bottomed landing craft. Ramsey Bader, a black British tank driver, 
He called that his unit all became ill during the crossing, suffering from seasickness. Some, however, have been able to make the best of things, playing cards and chess or reading to while away the time, or attempting to learn a few, a few French phrases in preparation for their foreign adventure. Nearly 5,000 landing ships and assault craft were escorted by six battleships, four monitors, 23 cruisers, 104 destroyers and 152 escort vehicles, as well as the 277 minesweepers clearing channels ahead. Most were British, American and Canadian, but there were also French, Polish, Dutch and Norwegian warships. Almost everyone at every level was acutely conscious of taking part in a great historical event. Headquarters of the American 5th Corps, heading for Omaha Beach, recorded in its war diary the attempt to do what had been contemplated by all the great military leaders of modern European history. A cross-channel invasion was about to commence. Seaborne landings. As the Allied Armada approached the Normandy beaches, conditions for getting ashore were problematic. High tides and heavy seas caused serious difficulties for the assault troops. At Juno Beach, Canadian units launched their swimming tanks as close to the shore as possible. Sergeant Leo Gallopy remembered that at first when we launched in the water we were a lot more worried about fighting the sea than we were about fighting the Germans. Gallopy's tank made it safely ashore but others were less fortunate. At Omaha Beach strong currents impeded navigation and heavy waves swamped the swimming tanks. One US battalion launched 29 DD tanks. 27 were drowned straight away. Preventing Allied assault troops from getting pinned down on the beaches was crucial to the invasion's success. Following ineffectual preliminary air raids on German defences, naval bombardments continued throughout the day, which with HMS Mauritius providing cover and fire, first for the airborne troops and landed inland and subsequently over Sword Beach. Medical care and veterans voices. You can see a US medical corpsman administrating a saline drip in the photograph. Medical units landed with the assault groups. In the early stages of D-Day, casualty care options were limited. Medics urgently dressed wounds, administered morphine and conducted blood and plasma transfusions. However, shock and exposure pose serious risks to casualties awaiting medical attention on the beaches. Tank driver William Dunn was wounded by mortar fire and gunshots at Juno, suffering appalling injuries to his spine and legs, as well as the loss of his left arm. He lay on the beach until early evening. My legs just gave way from me and I just collapsed. I didn't know how badly I was wounded then. Then two lads came and dragged me back and laid me beside a sand dune, gave me a cigarette and a drink and just left me there. I was left there for quite a while and that was the story of William Dunn, a sapper of 5th Assault Regiment, the Royal Engineers. Later on D-Day, casualties began to be evacuated by LSTs, landing ships, tanks, converted to carry severe 100 cases at a time back to hospitals in the UK. Others were moved to casualty clearing stations and field hospitals further inland. Allied casualties on June 6 at midnight were 10,000 killed, wounded, missing or taken prisoners. The Royal Army Medical Corps. After landing at Juno on the morning of D-Day, medical orderly Edward Kendall's surgical unit moved rapidly off the beach to set up an operating theatre in a nearby chateau. 
Kendall assisted with critical surgical operations for the next 18 hours straight and said, You didn't know what wound you were going to expect. Mines were the worst, terrible wounds because we got people coming in with their foot hanging off. You couldn't do much, you just had to answer. Surgical teams faced extra dangers due to the proximity of highly inflammable nitrous oxide gas cylinders, which had to be sandbagged against enemy bombs. Yet without this form of anesthesia, units like Kendall's could not have performed their life-saving surgeries. The men of the 116th Infantry Regiment, heading for Omaha Beach, found it hard to forget the address of their commanding officer, Colonel Charles Cannon. He had predicted two out of three would never return home. A senior British officer on the Empire Broadsword provided an equally discouraging add-on when he had finished his pep talk. Don't worry if you do not survive the assault, as we have plenty of backup troops who will just go in over you. The RAF was putting up a maximum effort that night, apart from the aircraft, on deception and missions. 1,000 bombers took off to attack 10 coastal batteries during darkness with, with more than 5,000 tons of bombs. RAF Typhoon fighter bombers and American P-47 Thunderbolts would hunt inland along approach routes ready to strafe any columns of German troops advancing to reinforce the coast. Casualty list lengthened. Despite efforts to protect assault troops, getting across the beaches was a rough process, physically and psychologically. At Gold Beach, Lieutenant Colonel Harold Nelson Smith's infantrymen faced heavy crossfire from the supposedly destroyed German strongpoint at La Hama. I remember telling the troops very heartily that we would find only rubble, barbed wire and a lot of wrecked defences. Although his soldiers eventually took the hammer, the Hampshire Regiment suffered heavy casualties on the beach, including Nelson Smith. Soldiers who were landed later on were confronted with the dreadful human wreckage of the earlier attacks on the shores. Benny Gordon, an NCO in the African-American 498th Port Battalion, came ashore at Omaha a day or so, so after June the 6th. When asked what he could remember, he replied, You see arms, legs on the water. You see field equipment on the water, where someone's, you know, maybe got shot. Although a combat tattoo, taboo, bared women from fighting, nurses like Cecilia Christie travelled across the channel to care for D-Day's casualties, working close to the front lines. They shared the horrors and dangers of the Normandy campaign. Serving with the 32nd Psychiatric Hospital, Christie nursed traumatised soldiers suffering acute battle neurosis as the summer progressed, treating the psychological wounds of David Day constituted an increasingly heavy workload for the Allied medical teams in Normandy. Omaha won. The objective for the American 1st and 29th Infantry Divisions was Omaha Beach, a long, gentle, curving stretch of coastline. Approaching from the sea, the beach ended on the right with massive cliffs. Four miles further round to the west, to the west was the Point de Hoc promontory. This was where a battalion of rangers had to scale a sheer cliff to silence a German battery. Eisenhower, Montgomery and Bradley all insisted on an attack at 0630 hours, refuting the request of General Leonard Gerau, commander of V Corps, who wanted to begin the operation at low tide on the cover of darkness. They could not risk an attack on one beach when the other four beaches would also begin the assault at 0630 hours. 27 out of the 32 tanks founded and sank. Only two reached the beach, 
Three more could not be launched because of the ramp jam. Altogether, 33 tank crewmen drowned. The rest of them were rescued later. One of the myths of Omaha is that the German defenders possessed numerous 88mm guns. In fact, they had just two. Most of their artillery at Omaha consisted of far less accurate Czech 100mm guns. The first wave of troops in their landing craft thought the heavy guns of the battleships had done their job. Not so, as dead fish were floating in the water, the bombardment had fallen short. The troops all suffered from motion sickness. By then, the landing craft reeked of vomit. Omaha 2. When the ramps were dropped, German machine gunners concentrated their fire on the opening. A soldier in the 116th said, My three squadron leaders in front were hit. Some men climbed over the side. Two more were hit. I crawled to hide behind the steel beach obstacles. Bullets hit off it, but others hit more of my men. Screams for help came from men hit and drowning under ponderous loads. There were dead men floating in the water. Sergeant Pilgrim Robertson had a gaping wound in his forehead as he walked crazily in the water without his helmet. The Germans cut him in half with their deadly crossfire. The prospect of crossing the stretch of beach in front of them seemed impossible. Any idea of running through the shallows carrying heavy equipment in sodden clothes and boots seemed like a bad dream. Overburdened soldiers stood little chance. One had 750 rounds of machine gun ammunition, as well as his own equipment. Many men afterwards estimated their casualties would have been hard if the first wave had attacked carrying less weight. While the German machine gunners turned the shore into a killing zone, a staff sergeant on the eastern side of the Omaha saw a direct hit on an assault boat. Several men were blown 50 or 60 feet in the air, with many of their officers and non-coms among the first casualties. Soldiers realised they had to get across the beach, if only to survive. I've never seen so many brave men who did so much. Many would go back to help the wounded and got themselves killed. At least 80% of our weapons didn't work because of sand and seawater and almost all of the radios failed to work and this contributed greatly to the chaos, said a soldier from Minnesota in the 1st Division. As the follow-up wave approached, survivors watched with a sick sensation from the bank of stones under the sea wall. A young officer in the 163, 116th Infantry recalled, some men were crying, others were cursing, I felt like a spectator as the ramps dropped men were tumbling just like corn cobs off a conveyor belt. Omaha 3. Captain Richard Bush, who had landed ahead of the 111th Field Artillery, described the soldiers he saw. They were beat up and shot. Many of them had forgotten that they had firearms to use. Battalion and company officers ordered their men to clean their weapons and told those without them to collect them from the dead. Captain Hull, a surgeon with the 1st Division, observed the different reaction of men under extreme stress. I saw a man coming to the boat in a fugue state, screaming and yelling, waving his arms. He had thrown all his equipment away. Many were hit in the water and the wounded were drowned by the rising tide. I yelled to some, urging them to crawl in. Many did not seem to be functioning at all mentally. They could move their limbs, but would not answer or do anything. A few of the wounded clasped, clasped onto the end of a beached landing craft as the water rose, then toppled off one by one and drowned. I saw one with a chest wound. One boy waded casually up the sand, strolling, but a young engineer, driven crazy by the terror, 
started run up, running up and down the beach until a bullet killed him. Captain Hull, with astonished admiration, watched one of his medical orders. Corporal A. Jones, who was always puny, 105 pounds and 5 foot 5 inches, was the last one to expect anything spectacular, spectacular of. In all this fire, when one would hardly have a chance to go down the beach and come back alive, he went out six times and broke my name. It was quite extraordinary. German artillery concentrated its fire on the Shermans. No fewer than 21 of the 743rd tank battalions, 51 Shermans, were knocked out. The tanks had run out of ammunition, moved up and down the beach to give shelter to infantrymen crossing the killing ground. A private in the 1st Division said, what saved us were the tanks. In fact, the first breakthrough on Omaha had already taken place when part of the 2nd Battalion of the 16th Infantry landed between San Laurent and Colville, crossing the beach with only two casualties. Omaha Force. The wounded were taken to ships such as the Samuel Chase and the Bayfield. On board there was organised confusion as doctors carried out triage. One wounded soldier suddenly realised his right leg was missing. The airmen held him down as he yelled, What am I going to do? My leg. I'm a farmer. Those who were going to die received morphine and plasma then left alone to whatever fate would befall them. Sailors carried the dead on litters to the ship's refrigerator, a solution which was not popular with the cooks. The Bayfield had only one experienced army surgeon, assisted by Navy surgeons unused to the work. Most of the medical orderlies had not seen battle wounds before. One of them, faced with a ranger who would receive terrible head wounds, did not realise that the man's brains were, were held in only by his helmet. So when he removed the helmet, the brain started to fall out. He tried to push the brain back into the skull with very little success. The doctor tried to reassure the horrified orderly that the man would have died anyway. At 10.46 hours, Colonel Talley radioed the USS Ancon. Things looked better that the landing system was in a hopeless mess. Many officers reported afterwards that until the beach was secured, only infantry, tanks and armoured bull bulldozers should have gone in. Brigadier General Cota was impatient. He went up to the bluff to see how the riflemen he had sent ahead were advancing. He found them pinned down by machine gun fire. So Cota, his 45 Colt automatic in his hand, said, OK, now let's see what you're made of. They reached a small road 300 yards inland where they came across a dead German. Almost every soldier seemed to remember the sight of their first dead German. One soldier in the 1st Division even saw the name of his first corps. His helmet was off and I could see Slitch printed inside it. They found themselves above the Viesemer exit and were held up by machine gun fire, so Cota sent out a flanking group to force the Germans to withdraw. Omaha 5. <clears throat> the build-up of forces soon accelerated. By 12.30 hours, the Americans had landed almost 19,000 men on Omaha. Half an hour later, a company from the 1st Division 16th Infantry Regiment began to attack Colville Sumer, but then found themselves bombarded by their own naval guns and suffered eight casualties. The 1st Division's 18th Infantry bypassed Colville while the fighting there still continued. A short time later, at 14-15 hours, the first German, German prisoners were identified from their paybooks. Once most of the observed fire on the beach had been eliminated, the armoured bulldozers cleared, cleared patches to speed the arrival of more troops and vehicles. Burnt out tanks were hauled aside. Even damaged landing craft were torn out of the way. One engineer with the 1st Division 
said that the smell of burnt flesh made it hard to eat for several days after. The medical teams were also working at frenetic speed. Many of the wounded, especially those suffering from shock, were doubly vulnerable to the cold. Soldiers were sent to salvage blankets from wrecked landing craft and gather extra field dressings from the dead. Medics could often do little more than administer morphine and patch up flesh wounds. Some of the wounded were beyond hope. I saw one young soldier pale, crying, and in obvious pain, with his intestines out under his uniform. There was nothing I could do except inject morphine and comfort him. He soon died, wrote a captain in the 60th Medical Battalion. Doctors treated those suffering from combat trauma with nembutal to knock them out. Plasma bags on drips were attached to those who had lost a lot of blood a condition indicated by their hands going blue. Yet even with blankets and plasma, many were to die from shock and exposure during the night. Casualties of all sorts could now be sent back on empty landing craft to the ships, but the wounded on the more deserted stretches had a long time to wait. Omaha, the summary. Even though high casualties on D-Day were far lighter than the planners estimates, that did not in any way reduce the shock of the first wave slaughter at Omaha. Company A of the 116th Infantry Regiment, a National Guard outfit, became a symbol of the sacrifice. One of the survivors of that company met Brigadier General Coulter next morning. Coulter asked him which unit he was from, and when he told him, Porter just shook his head in sadness. Around 100 men of the 215 had died. More were injured. Omaha became an American legend, but a crueler truth lay ahead in the fighting to come. The average losses per division on both sides in Normandy were to exceed those for Soviet and German divisions during an equivalent period on the Eastern Front. German losses on the Eastern Front averaged just under a thousand men per division per month, while in Normandy they averaged 2,300 per division per month. The calculation of comparable figures for the Red Army is much more complicated, but it would appear to be well under 1,500 per division per month. Allied losses in Normandy were close to an average of 2,000 per division per month. V Corps gave the figures later of 1,190 casualties for the 1st Division, 743 for the 29th Division and 441 for Corps troops. German losses amounted to around 1,200. The total number of American dead during the first 24 hours was almost 1,500. During his interviews with survivors, the official historian, Forrest Pogue, found they assumed that everyone else had been killed or captured. This kind of fog of war was responsible for terrible, terribly exaggerated casualty estimates, although those at the worst were still well under the pre-D-Day fears. The only certain fact is that 3,000 French civilians died in the first 24 hours of the invasion, double the total number of American dead. Utah and the Airborne. The dawn of D-Day on the Cotentin Peninsula brought only a little clarity to the scattered American airborne troops. The tall hedgerows of the Norman, Normandy fields made it harder to orientate themselves. For many, daylight meant that they could at last light a cigarette without giving their position away. Finding containers and equipment also became easier. A French boy with a horse and cow helped an airborne staff officer to get, gather them up. German soldiers also profited as a result of the manna from heaven, which had rained down in containers during the night. They helped themselves to American care rations and cigarettes. 
Paratroopers who survived the drop began to coalesce into mixed groups and attack their objectives. Although they had no radio contact with divisional headquarters, they were, however, aided by an even greater German confusion. The cutting of telephone wires by paratroopers and the resistance had proved an, an invaluable tactic. They had no idea where the main American paratroop forces were concentrated and they lacked leadership. General Fally of the 91st Lufthansa Division was dead from the ambush near his headquarters and General Graf von Schnigelberg, the commander of the 709th Infantry Division, was still absent. The 82nd Airborne Division had taken its chief objecti objective at St. Mary Glees, but it had landed close to the main units of 91st Lufthansa Division and would suffer numerous counter-attacks. Its other task was to secure the line of the River Murderer in preparation of 7 Corps to advance right across the peninsula. This proved hard since its units, units were so scattered. When a small bridgehead had been taken across the Murderer at Chef de Bon, the regimental surgeon of the 508th Parachute Infantry Regiment had to operate in the field with the barest equipment as all their medical bundles had been lost in the drop. Utah, three hours in. Soon after, or 300 hours, Major General Willie Gale and his divisional headquarters landed near the bridge at Ranville. Tall and heavily built, the unflappable Gale with his military moustache, a welcome sight to those from the first wave, Gale admitted to a private glee at being the first British general back in France since 1940. Other gliders brought in jeeps and anti-tank guns. Chester Wilmot, the BBC reporter, accompanied this way. The landing went just like an exercise, he reported optimistically, considering the state of most of the crash-landed gliders. As the Germans had flooded large areas, areas around the River Murdery, many paratroopers fell into the water. A number drowned, smothered by a salt chute or caught in tall trees. A number were shot as they struggled. Many atrocities were committed. The Germans bayoneted them from below or turned flamethrowers on them. A number spoke of bodies being obscenely mutilated. Those coming down into small pastures surrounded by heavy hedges were reassured if they saw cows, since their presence indicated there were no mines. The fighting became pitiless on both sides. In fact, that night probably saw the most vicious fighting of the whole war on the Western Front. Utah. While the 82nd was responsible for holding the western flank, the 101st Airborne Division task was to assist the landings at Utah. This included uh, suppressing German batteries and seizing causeways across the marshes just inland from the beach. Lieutenant Colonel Cole's group occupied the German battery position at St. Martin de Verabel, which they found abandoned. They then seized the western end of the causeway leading from Utah Beach across, across the flooded area. Apart from securing the causeways ready for the 4th Infantry Division's advance from Utah Beach, the other task of the 101st Airborne was to seize the lock on the River Douve at the Barquette and also take two bridges northeast of Carantan. This would later allow the American forces on the uh, Cotentin and the 29th Division advancing from Omaha to link up. The biggest threat in the area was the unexpectedly large German force in saint condé uh, uh, on the Carantin Sherberg Road. Major von der Heidt, a veteran of the German airborne invasion of Crete three years before, had pushed forward two battalions of his 6th Paratroop Regiment from Camden Town. His men, 
amongst the most experienced of the Luftwaffe's paratroop army were to prove formidable opponents. When dawn broke, they gazed in amazement at all the different parachutes lying in the fields. Ed himself went forward to St. Condemel later in the morning and climbed the church tower. From there he could see the huge armada of ships lying offshore. For American paratroopers, the sound of the naval bombardment of Utah Beach provided the first reassurance that the invasion was proceeding according to plan. But with the loss of so much equipment and ammunition in the drop, and the increasing, increasing concentration of German forces against them, everything depended on how quickly the 4th Infantry Division would arrive. Utah 2. The landings at Utah proved the most successful of all, largely due to good fortune. The naval bombardment force commanded by Rear Admiral Alan Kirk in the heavy cruiser USS Augusta was no less powerful than that at Omaha. Kirk had the battleship USS Nevada, the monitor HMS Erebus, heavy cruisers the Quincy and the Tuscaloosa, light cruisers uh, HMS Black Prince, the light cruiser HMS Enterprise with a dozen destroyers. As soon as the naval bombardment started, French civilians fled from their villages out into the countryside and awaited events in relative safety. Utah was the responsibility of the Seven Corps, commanded by Major General Joseph Lawton Collins, a dynamic leader known to his men as Lightning Joe. The assault was led by the 8th Infantry Regiment in Major General Raymond Barton's 4th Infantry Division. Luck certainly played a large part when the current pushed the landing craft towards the Via Estuary, meaning the 8th Infantry came ashore 2,000 yards further south than planned, but on a stretch of beach which uh, turned out to be far more lightly defended than they were supposed to have landed. The first senior officer ashore at Utah was the irrepressible Brigadier General Teddy Roosevelt, Jr., son of the former president and a cousin of Franklin D. Roosevelt. Teddy, who stalked around fiercely under fire with his walking stick, was loved by GIs for his jokes and extraordinary courage. Many suspected that he secretly, secretly hoped to die in battle. General Teddy was also known for preferring to wear the olive drab knitted cap and not a helmet, a habit for which he was often upbraided uh, by more senior generals because it set a bad example. The beaches were cleared of Germans in less than an hour. There was little of the expected excitement and not much confusion. Instead of opening 50 yard channels through obstacles, the engineers began to clear the whole beach at once. The contrast with Omaha Beach could not have been greater. The only factor the two beaches had in common was Allied air supremacy, the presence of lightnings, mustangs and spitfires almost constantly overhead, greatly boosted morale. Oberstenfuhrer Michael Whitman, the, the 101st Heavy SS Panzer Battalion, as at June 6, 1944, when the formation was initially created, Michael Whitman was assigned Tiger 204, 205, the command vehicle of the 2nd Platoon. During the course of the Normandy campaign, this vehicle broke down and Whitman was to commandeer a number of different vehicles including 222, which saw action at Billy's Bocage, and 231, in which he was filmed soon after receiving the sword to his Knight's Cross. Following the injuries to Battalion Commander Heinz von Westerhagen in July, Whitman assumed command of the battalion, and with it the Battalion Commander's Tiger 007. It was in this vehicle that Whitman was killed on August 8, 1944. Apparently he destroyed 137 Sherman tanks. The photograph shows him on the left 
with his gunner from the eastern front, Balthus and Arm Wall, hands on hips, far right. French civilians were afraid that the landings might fail, like the raid on Dieppe in 1942, and that the Germans would return to take revenge on anyone who had assisted the Americans. Rumours even spread that the invasion had failed, so when the Shermans and elements of the 4th Infantry Division made contact with the 101st, the relief was considerable. When the 60 gliders of the 325th Glider Regiment swooped in, fierce machine gun fire opened up. They lost 160 men, killed or injured, on landing. But survivors had all their equipment and were fresh. They went into action that night, fording the River Murderer, swinging left to secure the crossing at the Fier on the west side. Utah 3. One German captive spoke to an American soldier of German origin. There isn't much left of New York, is there? What do you mean? Well, did you not know it's been bombed by the Luftwaffe? Americans were to find that many German soldiers had swallowed the most outrageous lies of Nazi propaganda without question. On the evening of June 6th, 2,000 hours, Allied bombers began to flatten St. Law systematically as part of a strategy to block major road junctions and thus delay German reinforcements rushing to the invasion area. The Allied warnings over the radio and by leaflet had either not been received or not been taken seriously. Windows and doors flew open across rooms. The grandfather clock fell flat, tables and chairs danced a ballet said a citizen. Terrified families fled to their cellars and a number were buried alive. Old soldiers from the First World War refused to shelter underground as they had seen too many comrades suffocate under the earth bombarded trenches. The air became choked with dust from smashed masonry during this night of the great nightmare. They saw the double spires of their small cathedral silhouetted against the flames, many burst into tears at the sight of their ruined town. As soon as the air raid started, many had instinctively run out to the countryside, where they sought shelter in barns and farmyards. When they finally summoned the courage to return to St. Law, they were horrified by the smell of corpses still buried beneath the ruins. Some 300 civilians had died Normandy, they discovered, was to be the sacrificial lamb of the liberation of France. Gold and Juno. In the ancient Norman city of Caen, people were awake much earlier than usual after reports of paratroop drops had been confirmed. The uh, HQ of the 716th Infantry Division on the Avenue de Bagatelle came to life. By 0600 hours, the shops in Cannes were besieged by housewives buying baguettes, but then German soldiers, spotting the crowds, rushed up to take the bread for themselves. They also seized bottles of alcohol from cafes. Some boys cycled furiously towards the beaches, and when they returned, they shouted, They are landing, the sea is black with ships, the Bosch are screwed. Meanwhile, Rom, Rommel was woken at home in Herlingen, near Ulm, where he had gone to celebrate his wife's birthday. Speedle rang him at 06.30 hours, as soon as reports of the huge invasion fleet anchored offshore were confirmed. Of the three British beaches, gold in the west was closest to Homer. The landing there of the 50th Northumberland Northumbrian Division was the one that took pressure of the Americans. Gold lay between Aramanche and La Riviere. Gold and June or two. Each hour was at or 7.30 hours, one hour after the Americans on the right, but the basic pattern remained the same. With bombing, shelling from the sea, 
and then rocket ships firing close in, and cruisers, HMS, Ajax and Argonaut kept up a constant shelling of the German heavy coastal battery at Long, which the bombers had failed to destroy. Rough seas and vomiting affected the assault troops, just as at Omaha. The two armoured regiments launching their DD uh, tanks rightly decided to ignore the order, floor to 5,000. The Sherwood Rangers Yeomanry on the left launched their two squadrons of swimming Shermans at only 1,000 yards out, yet still lost eight tanks. The right hand brigade group, led by the 1st Battalion of the Royal Hampshires and the 1st Dorsets, landed on the beach east of La Hamel and the small seaside resort of Aramash, Laban. The, the tanks of the Sherwood Rangers were delayed by the rough sea and the Hampshires suffered a bloody landing at La Hamel. Their commanding officer and several of their HQ officers became casualties almost immediately. But the battalion fought on, backed up by the second Devons. It took most of the day before German resistance was finally eliminated. The 5th Battalion of the East Yorkshire Regiment had a hard fight on the extreme left-hand side of Gold Beach at La Riviere, where the concrete defences had survived the shelling after several armoured vehicles had been knocked out. An armoured tank appeared. The, the 40 pound petard bomb fired from its stubby barrel managed to destroy the emplacement con containing the anti tank bomb which had in fact inflicted so many losses. The AVRE were the Assault Vehicle Royal Engineers. This vehicle, based on a Churchill tank, had been developed by the 79th Armoured Division under Major General Percy Hobart to destroy concrete emplacements. It had other roles such as bridge laying and filling anti-tank ditches with fascines. With fascines. A fascine is a rough bundle of brushwood or other material used for strengthening an earthen structure or making a path across uneven or wet terrain. Having secured La Hamel, the Hampshire's advanced west towards Aramage La Hamel where the Mulberry Artificial Harbour was to be sighted. Number 47 Commando of the Royal Marines, which had lost three landing craft to mines, was to push even further west with the mission to take Port en Bassin. This was where the British right flank would join up with the American 1st Division, spreading left from Omaha. Gold and Juno 3. The Green Howards moved rapidly on Mont Fleury, where they forced the German defenders, shaken by the naval bombardment, to surrender. Company Sergeant Major Stanley Hollis first showed his quite selfless, selfless courage there. Hollis's company commander suddenly noticed that they had passed two pillboxes. He and Hollis went to investigate when a machine gun opened on, up on them. Hollis charged the pillbox firing his Sten submachine gun, jumped it on top to reload and threw three grenades inside. Later, when the Green Howards advanced on the village of Crepon, his consistent bravery won him the only uh, Victoria Cross awarded that day. And we heard about uh, Stanley Hollis earlier on in the talk. In Crepon, his company encountered a German position with a field gun and MG-42 machine guns. Hollis mounted an attack from a house on the flank. The field gun was traversed onto them. Hollis led his men out, but on finding that two had been left behind, he mounted a diversionary attack, armed with a brain gun, and rescued them. Juno Beach, the central sector of the 2nd British Army, extending from La Riviere to St. Aubin's Sumer. Juno was the objective of the 3rd Canadian Division who were determined to take revenge for the Dieppe Raid, the disastrous experiment from which fewer than half their men returned. Dieppe had provided a cruel but vital lesson for the planning of Dean Day. 
never attack a heavily defended port from the sea. And if I remember rightly, the took place in 1942 uh, with 6,000 men and 3,000 of them died. The 3rd Canadian Division was commanded by Major General Rod Keller, a large man with a round, florid face and military moustache. He was known as a com compulsive raconteur with a penchant for whiskey. The Canadians, despite their battle dress uniform and regimental system inherited from the British Army, in many ways felt closer to the Americans than their mother country. They cultivated a certain scepticism towards British Army conventions and referred to Overlord as Operation Overboard after being smothered in instructions from British staff officers at 2nd Army headquarters. Gold and Juno 4. Only the arrival of the AVR tank firing its hefty petards onto the Bunker system at St. Auburn Samaire brought resistance there to an end at 11.30 hours. Meanwhile, another company from the North Shore Regiment, which had entered the town after blowing gaps in the wire with Bangalore torpedoes, continued to fight from house to house with grenades, rifles, and brain guns. They too faced the danger of Germans re emerging from tunnels behind them to fight on. French Canadians of the Regiment de la Chaudière received a rapturous welcome from locals as soon as he spoke to them in French. Many rushed down to their cellars to fetch a keg of, a keg of cider for the soldiers. But when the farming families began to pull the boots off dead Germans, the Canadians were clearly shocked. They had no idea that the Germans had commandeered all supplies of leather for the Wehrmacht. Major General Keller was expecting a counter-attack by the 21st Panzer Division and wanted his advance elements to be in defensive positions by nightfall. One cannot criticise the Canadians for the way they went about it. The battle group of the North Nova Scotia Highlanders rightly used all the vehicles available. Light Stewart tanks, Shermans, M10, tank destroyers, trucks and brain gun carriers to speed the advance. If Keller had known of the panic and chaos on the airfield, he might have pushed them on. The third Luftlot in Paris reported at Carpiquet at 1920 hours on June 6th, everybody lost their heads badly. The station commander gave orders for evacuation. As the 12th SS Panzer Division Hitler observed, takeoff runway at Karpike inefficiently blown up. Rest of taxi in area hardly damaged at all. Most of the fuel could still be saved. Over the next few weeks, the airfield and its surrounds saw some of the most bitter fighting of the whole battle for Normandy against the Hitler Jugend Division. It would take just over a month before Carpique was finally in Allied hands. Sword. The landings of the British 3rd Infantry Division at the eastern end on Sword Beach between St. Orvin Sumer and the River Orne had heavy guns in support. The battleships HMS Ramillies and Warspite, the Monitor HMS Roberts, were augmented by four cruisers, including the Polish ship Dragon and 13 destroyers. The Overlord planners had increased this naval support because of the many German batteries in the sector. The landing craft were lowered into the heavy sea at 0530 hours and, after circling, made their way in shore, vainly attempting to maintain formation. One commander, in the 2nd Battalion of the East Yorkshire Regiment read extracts from Shakespeare's Henry V to his men over the tannoy, but most of them were probably too seasick to pay much attention. Many regretted the tot of Navy, Navy rum with breakfast. The DD tank crews of the 13th, 18th Hussars and the Staffordshire Yeomanry 
felt a different form of nausea when they received the order four to five thousand, the launching, launching of the swimming tanks planned for 8,000 yards out had been reduced, but it was still a very long way to go in a sea with waves five feet high. Surprisingly, only six out of the 40 sank, two of them as a result of being rammed by a landing craft out of control. At 0650 hours, the self-propelled guns of the 3rd Infantry Division also opened fire from their landing craft a range of 10,000 yards. Just before landing, an officer with the 41st Royal Marine Commando observed those around him on the landing craft. Some were scared shitless, others fiercely proud just to be part of it. Anticipation with nervous excitement showed everywhere. The first wave of infantry, the 1st Battalion, the South Lancashire Regiment, and the 2nd East Yorkshire's arrived to find that the 1st DD tanks were already ashore and firing at stone points. The South Lancs immediately attacked the German position opposite the beach. Their commanding officer died 10 feet from the top of the beach with the battalion medical officer wounded beside him. A Bren gun platoon landing in carriers charged straight up the beach and the defenders surrendered. Sword 2. The second battalion of the Middlesex Regiment was astonished to be welcomed by a man in a brass fireman's helmet like a Napoleonic dragoon. This was the mayor of Colville, accompanied by a young woman who wasted no time in starting to care for the wounded. Other young women showed extraordinary bravery, coming to the beaches to help. They ignored the wolf whistles of the amazed squaddies set to work bandaging wounds. One woman was there for two days and during the course of it she met her future husband, a young English officer. A young officer landing in the second wave noticed a fat German officer held prisoner with six of his men. He suddenly protested to a sergeant that under the Geneva Convention they had a right to be taken to a place of safety. So the sergeant threw a spade at him and yelled, well, dig yourself a fucking hole then. <laughs> Lord Lovett's first special service brigade landed near Colville. His commandos had thrown away their helmets and wore their green berets instead. Lovett's personal piper, Billy Millen, from the Cameron Highlanders began playing Island Laddie when he strode out of the surf. Then Lovett asked him to play. <laughs> the road to the islands. While marching up and down the beach, Lovett's conspicuous bravery prompted his men to refer to him as the Mad Bastard. As they advanced beside the Cannon Canal, a German rifleman jumped down from a tree and dashed into a cornfield. Lovett dropped to one knee, one knee and killed him with a single shot from his deer-stalking rifle, almost as if the man was a stack. The massive armoured counter-attack never materialised after General Marx received an order at 0930 hours to go back through Khan. A tragic move as he was expo exposed to fighter bomber attacks. Having set out with the 104 Mark IV Panzers, the two battalions were re reduced to 60 by the time they reached the Perrier Ridge late in the afternoon. General Marx, the Corps Commander, formed 7th Army Headquarters at 0925 hours to obtain the 12th SS Panzer Division Hitler Jürgen, but they refused by saying the main landing was going to come at an entirely different place, and once again he was told that only the Führer could make the decision, and that did not happen until 1500 hours. Sword 3. The failure of the British 3rd Infantry Division to, see, to seize their objective at Khan soon proved critical. If Montgomery had intended to seize the city, then he failed to put in place the resources his forces needed to carry out such a daring stroke. The presence of the 21st Panzer Division made his stated objective far too optimistic. The plan was 
for the 8th Infantry Brigade to seize the Pernier Ridge. Then the 185th Brigade with three infantry battalions plus one armoured regiment would pass through them and on to camp. The three infantry battalions were ready at Hermanville by 1100 hours. There was no sign of the Staffordshire, Staffordshire Yeomanry. The, the brigade uh, commander agonised whether to attack on foot. After waiting an hour, he ordered the infantry to set off. The 8th Brigade, attacking Perrier Ridge, were hampered by two strong points called named Hillman and Morris, who had four 105mm guns. Its dispirited defenders surrendered after an hour, but Hillman was a far more formidable complex, spread out over 400 yards by 600 yards. It had deep concrete pillboxes and steel cupolas with a system of connecting trenches. Although the British were suffering many casualties around Hillman, the 60,000 citizens of Khan endured far worse. The heavy, heavy bombers of the RAF began to bomb the city at 13.45 hours. They dropped leaflets telling the citizens to leave the city immediately, but only a few hundred left before the bombers arrived. A young man found a looter at work and threatened to arrest him. The looter laughed in his face. So the young man swung his spade at him and severed the man's jugular. At the looters, in the looters' pockets were jewels and several hand with rings on their fingers. Khan's population of 60,000 was reduced to 17,000. A contradiction lingers within this strategy of bombing. If Monty really did intend to capture Khan on the first day, then why, why did he want the RAF to smash it so that its streets became impassable? That could only help the defender. Sword 4. In London, the streets and shops were empty, with taxis cruising unable to find a customer. Less than 200 miles to the south, the battle for Hillman raged on. The unfortunate Suffolk's were unfairly blamed for the delay and so was their brigade, brigadier. The main fault lay with the 3rd Division's lack of support, such as AVREs, which could have knocked out bunkers with their petards and nobody can blame the King's Shropshire Light Infantry, who had insufficient armoured support. No, the responsibility rested at higher levels. Neither General Sir Miles Dempsey, the Commander-in-Chief of British Second Army, nor General Montgomery had thought, th thought through this vital part of the operation and allotted priorities clearly enough. By happy coincidence for the British, the, the dramatic appearance at 20-30 hours of nearly 250 gliders bringing an air landing brigade to reinforce the 6th Airborne Division helped persuade General March to withdraw. The battlefield virtually froze as everyone stared in admiration at the sight, but suddenly the flak detachment and machine guns of the 21st Panzer opened up, firing furiously. They brought down fewer than a dozen gliders, although they claimed 26. Hillman was finally subdued at 2015 hours. The Suffolk's began to dig in for the night and their supporting tank squadron pulled back to Riyadh. All work stopped as they too watched the gliders arrive. Their commanding officer noted it equally impressed the German prisoners, but in a different way, they did not seem to think it was quite fair. A different sense of unreality still cocooned their supreme commander at the Burghoff. Three hours before, General Gunther Blumentry, the chief of staff of OB West, had to tell the 7th Army Headquarters that Hitler wanted the enemy annihilated by the evening of June 6, since there exists a danger of additional sea and airborne landings. In accordance with an order from General Jodl, all units must be diverted to the point of penetration in Kalfados. The beachhead there must be cleaned up by not later than tonight. 
Hitler's Luftwaffe adjutant Nicholas von Bello, who was with him at the Burghoff, saw that Hitler had not yet accepted the true might of Allied ship air power, still convinced the ground forces could be thrown back. Remember the fallen. After the war, many veterans did not discuss the day. Demobilised British soldiers were instructed not to talk about their experiences, often carrying the psychological scars of war silently for decades. However, in later life, veterans often chose to make their stories public. Retirement gives the leisure gave some the leisure to take stock of their experiences, while others were anxious that the wartime sacrifices of their aging generation should not be forgotten. Telling their stories allowed D-Day veterans to process, process the emotional costs of their service. The photo shows a British Army military policeman in May 1945 tending to the grave of his friend at Bayer War Cemetery in Normandy. Cecilia Christie, nursing officer, Queen Alexandra's Royal Army Nursing Corps, added this, I think the effect it had on me was that I cannot see a soldier or hear a military band or anything like that without being choked because of seeing all those injured soldiers in Normandy. Changes in people's recollections and narratives over the years actually offer us valuable evidence about the enduring impacts of war. At the going down of the sun and in the morning we will remember them. The top photograph shows veteran Raymond Shook, a, mar a paratrooper on D-Day, visiting the D-Day Museum in Portsmouth on June the 3rd, 2014, while the bottom photograph shows veteran Harry Buckley on June the 5th, 2009, at Colby, Montgomery, where he landed in 1944. Edward Kendall, NCO, the Royal Army Men Medical Corps, said, I often thought about going back on holiday to sea. But something stopped me. I don't know whether I didn't want to relive it or whether I have that picture in my mind of D-Day. As you have heard, these veterans did not remember the horrors of war. Their recollections show humour, friendship and resilience too. We get a sense of the complex feelings that veterans attach to their memories and what D-Day meant to that person many years later. Until the late 1970s, historians dismissed memory as an invalid source of historical evidence. Today, however, scholars approach memories differently, recognising that we do not remember the past passively, but make and remake our memories constantly over our lifetime. Changes in people's recollections and narratives over the years actually offer us valuable evidence about the enduring impacts of war. So, we ask new questions about how and why, as well as what, our veterans remember to help us better understand the cultural and emotional legacies of D-Day. Facts and figures for D-Day. The Allies, although they had failed to secure key objectives, were at least assured. Hitler's beloved panzer divisions were incapable of dislodging them now, but the fighting ahead would make the Allied casualties suffered on D-Day appear light in comparison. Those British formations were felt, which felt that they had done it all before in North Africa were about to receive a nasty shock when they came up against the Waffen SS. Allied air power could do comparatively little to help them when it came to fighting skilled and determined defenders village by village in the cornfields around Cannes 
and failed by failed in Normandy. 21st Army Group headquarters had predicted 9,250 casualties out of the 70,000 soldiers landing on the first day. Some 3,000 of these sailors, paratroopers landing in flooded areas and crews of DD tanks were expected to suffer death by drowning. In the event, casualty figures are very hard to define for DD itself, since most formations figures accounted for a longer period. Nevertheless, uh, the June 6th to 10th, in the confusion of the time, the high figure of missing had to be constantly recalculated, some with some proof killed, some to have joined up with other units, some unaccounted wounded taken back to England, and others later found to have been taken prisoner. In very rough terms, British and Canadian casualties for DD itself were around 3,000 killed, missing and wounded. American losses were much higher because of Omaha Beach and the two airborne divisions. General Bradley gave a figure of uh, almost 4,700 US seaborne casualties. But this appears on the high side when compared with divisional returns. The only accurate figures one can give are those from June 6th to 20th inclusive. American First Army losses came to 24,162, of whom 3,082 were killed, just over 13,000 wounded, and almost 8,000 missing. British casualties over the same period totaled 13,572, of whom 1,842 were killed, 8,600 wounded, and just over 3,000 missing. Canadian casualties for the same period amounted to 2,850, of whom 363 were killed, 1,359 wounded, and uh, 1,093 missing. I truly hope you have found this talk informative and inspirational. Our ancestors didn't let us down. In fact, they went above and beyond fighting to secure our futures. We owe a huge debt to them, which can never be repaid. A message from King Charles II. Dear Mr. Ainsworth, the King has asked me to thank you for your thoughtful message of support, which is sent in recognition of the 80th anniversary of the D-Day landing. Their Majesties were deeply moved by the commemoration in the United Kingdom and France and by the support felt across the world for the veterans and those who lost their lives. In his speech at the British Normandy Memorial in Versailles, the King said, Our obligation to remember them, what they stood for and what they achieved for us all can never diminish. His Majesty was heartened by your most thoughtful and poignant appreciation of those who gave their lives. The King was touched to learn of your interest in Operation Overlord and wishes you well in your endeavours to deliver, to deliver talks to your community. Thank you once again for writing to His Majesty who has asked me to send his warmest good wishes. <laughs>